So hello, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our latest webinar. Our topic today is Sheath for Success, Simple Techniques to Make Buildings Stronger and More Energy Efficient. My name is Warren Hamrick. I am an engineered wood specialist covering the Carolinas for APA. I'm part of APA, the Engineered Wood Association's Field Service Division, and I'm gonna serve as moderator for the session. So APA is a nonprofit trade association representing manufacturers of a variety of common structural engineered wood products. So in addition to quality verification and product testing, APA conducts research to improve engineered wood products and systems where they are used. We also educate users and specifiers on the product's intended use and potential applications. Before we start today's webinar, I need to cover some housekeeping details. Corey's presentation will last about 50 minutes. We have a panelist today, and she and I will be answering questions as they come in, as well as asking some of Corey during the Q&A session at the end of the program as time permits. I'd also like to note that today's webinar is approved for AIA and ICC continuing education credits. After the conclusion of the webinar, you can get customized certificates of completion for AIA, ICC, or any self-reported CEU. And we want you to know that your feedback is really important to us. There's a QR code on your screen. If you open uh, your camera on your smartphone, a link will pop up and take you to the survey on this session. Our presenter today is Corey McCambridge, engineered wood specialist for APA based in the Toronto area. Corey consults with and conducts workshops for designers, code officials, and other building professionals on best practices for specification, selection, and application of engineered wood products. I'm going to let Corey provide you with more detail on his background before joining APA in just a moment. For those of you just joining us, welcome to our webinar, Sheath for Success. I will now turn the microphone over to our speaker. Corey McCambridge. All right, thank you for the introduction, Warren. And once again, welcome everybody. As mentioned, my name is Corey McCambridge and I'm the Canadian representative for APA, the Engineered Wood Association. Before I joined APA five years ago, I spent over 10 years in the prefabricated panel industry as a design manager and project estimator for various facilities located across Canada. During that time, I developed an expertise in architectural and structural design analysis and have a proven track record in value engineering because of it. We're happy to have you in attendance for our session today, Sheath for Success, where we will discuss how wood structural panel wall sheathing balances structural integrity, energy efficiency, and cost effectiveness with a single product that is sustainable and environmentally friendly. Here are the learning objectives for our session. They were listed on the webinar registration page, so I'm not going to bother reading through them all. However, I did want to quickly highlight them before we begin. Our agenda today is as follows. As mentioned, our discussion will revolve around the benefits of wood structural panel wall sheathing. We will discuss how fully sheathed walls add strength and resiliency to our structures and allow designers to meet bracing requirements. We will explore how their use ties into energy codes and building envelopes capable of supporting multiple cladding systems. We will learn how to tie all of these benefits together with the use of advanced framing using a completely renewable resource, wood. By understanding the big picture, it's easy to see how fully sheathed walls offer many advantages. During our session today, I would like to help paint that picture by highlighting the benefits displayed here on the screen. We will begin with the most obvious benefit of wood structural panel wall sheathing. In the coming slides, I would like to discuss how incorporating OSB or plywood wall sheathing into our designs adds strength and rigidity to our structures, and how we can use them to create a structural shell, helping to tie roof, wall, floor and foundation systems together so they can act as a unit to safely resist lateral 
and uplift loads. Well, what are lateral and uplift loads? Well, lateral loads are forces that act on the side of a structure, parallel to the ground, as shown here. During a wind event, the wind forces push against the structure on the windward side and pull on the leeward side, while at the same time, vertical or uplift forces attempt to separate the roof from the structure. For this reason, it is critical that our walls are braced to resist these types of forces. Before we start looking at some of the damage they are capable of causing, let's talk about tornadoes. The Fujita scale is intended to help classify tornadoes according to intensity by the amount and type of damage observed. This is because measurements of actual wind speeds are difficult to perform. What most people don't realize is that 96% of all tornadoes have a rating of EF2 or less. Looking at the chart, we'll see that an EF2 tornado has wind speeds capable of reaching a maximum of 135 miles per hour or 220 kilometers per hour. We often hear that it isn't possible to design for tornadoes, but with 96% of them being EF2s, it is quite possible to significantly improve a structure's performance during these storms. Without proper consideration, small details can amount to total structural failure. Improper wall bracing and wall attachment to the foundation likely led to this failure. And here we see another example of structural failure due to lateral forces. In this case, the walls were well designed, but the entire structure moved almost 40 feet off of its foundation. Is it possible to resist these types of forces? By using structural wall sheathing, such as OSB and plywood on our walls, and tying roof, wall, floor, and foundation systems together, it most certainly is. Studs by themselves have very little racking resistance. When a load is applied to a wall, the nail joints between the studs and plates act like hinges. The use of OSB or plywood panels attached to the wall framing adds rigidity and enables the wall to resist lateral forces. This is how wall bracing and shear walls work to resist the lateral loads caused by wind and seismic events. This graph illustrates the racking strength of three wood framed wall assemblies. One is braced using diagonal two by four lead bracing. Another is partially sheathed with wood structural panel wall sheathing, and the final wall is fully sheathed and includes window openings. It is important to note that in order for the diagonal lead bracing to resist racking forces, it must be installed at a 45 to 60 degree angle. As you can see, the fully sheathed wall with openings was able to provide up to 88% more racking resistance when compared to the partially sheathed wall with no openings. There are two methods to resist wind and seismic loads, wall bracing and shear walls. Wood structural panels are good options in both lateral resistance methods. Wall bracing is the IRC's prescriptive solution to resisting wind and seismic events. Across the US, most homes are built in accordance with the prescriptive wall bracing provisions of the code. To use prescriptive construction, the designer is limited to a maximum building size, maximum wall height, and normal lateral loads. Normal lateral loads are considered to be wind speeds less than 140 miles per hour and exclude high seismic activity on loose soils. Braced wall panels are prescriptive elements of a structure that resist lateral loads. If the house design exceeds the prescriptive limitations of the code, the house will have to be engineered. Engineered design uses shear walls to resist lateral loads. And shear walls are engineered elements of buildings and require calculations. APA has excellent tools to assist with the design of wall bracing and shear walls that can be accessed via our company website. One of them is the APA wall bracing calculator, 
which is updated every code cycle beginning with the 2009 IRC. There is a quick start guide available for download at the start page, as well as a short step-by-step -step video to help get you going. In addition to the calculator, there are a number of publications and related resources, such as the 2018 IRC Wood Wall Bracing Provisions Guide, which is available on the iccsafe.org website. Our Introduction to Wall Bracing publication, which can be found at apawood.org, along with a three-part webinar series that covers the 2018 wall bracing provisions, which is also available via the APA website. Adding OSB or plywood to our walls does more than just help our structures meet the IRC bracing requirements. With more of us experiencing an increased amount of high wind or seismic events, resilient construction is becoming more important to homeowners and builders. The resilience of a structure relates to its ability to withstand and recover from a disaster. The small details or lack thereof can have a negative impact on the performance of our structures during high wind events. In the coming slides, I would like to discuss how we can use wood structural panel wall sheathing to create a structural shell. This is a cost-effective method for adding strength and resilience to our structures, especially when combined with some of the other benefits that we'll be discussing today. I would like to point out that some of the design recommendations found within this guide exceed the minimum code requirements and typical APA recommendations. Without a properly designed structural shell, our buildings are susceptible to failure during high wind events as illustrated in this example. Here we can see that the flexible sheathing has torn along the rim board and the wall has fallen. And here we can see that the entire roof and a portion of the second story of this home have been removed due to a high wind event. The non-structural sheathing at the front of the home has torn at the rim board and allowed the wall to fail. At this home, the second floor was well designed to resist these loads and stayed intact for the most part. The first floor, however, was either underdesigned or not properly built and collapsed. This type of failure is called soft story failure. And we've seen some soft story failures up here in Canada over the past four years, which are similar to this home located in the Toronto area. In this case, the ground floor walls failed to resist the lateral forces, and only the second floor walls remained. And this photo shows us a clear image of racking in the exterior wall system. These are second floor wall systems. The first floor walls have completely failed. This roof section managed to stay intact for the most part. The roof anchors worked well, holding the rafters or trusses to the upper top plate. Unfortunately, in this example, the load path still failed at the connection between the upper and lower top plates, and the roof was pulled off of the house with the upper top plate still attached. A nail can be seen sticking out of the upper top plate where it failed in withdrawal at its connection to the lower top plate. And here are a few more examples where the top plates were pulled apart or off of the wall. By using roof anchors, the uplift forces applied to the roof are all transferred into the top plate. But how are top plates connected? And how are they fastened to the studs? With the use of end nails, face nails, or toenails, and we're all aware of the vulnerabilities of these types of connections. So how can we prevent this failure and strengthen the weak point in this area? by overlapping OSB or plywood wall sheathing and fastening to the very top plate, we're able to safely transfer forces through this critical weak point in the load path, similar to holding your hat on your head on a windy day. As we move from the roof to the connection between stories, 
we find another weak point. This too is an area where we see a lot of failures. Here is an example of a home that did not account for uplift at this junction. Instead, it depended on nails in withdrawal to transfer the lateral and uplift forces from the upper story to the lower story. A closer look at the detail at the base of the second floor wall shows that the wall sheathing stops at the bottom plate, while the first floor wall sheathing stops just below that. If we look at a cross section of the detail, we can see that the two pieces of sheathing do not attach to a common framing member. This means that all lateral and uplift forces gathered from above must go through the nails that attach the bottom plate to the second floor before they can move into the first floor wall sheathing. As you can see by the photo, the connection was not strong enough to transfer this load. The bottom plate was pulled off the entire length of the side of the house. The rear corner of the house was stiff enough to hang on to the end piece of OSB, but the load was still great enough to rip the OSB in half in the long panel dimension. There are multiple methods for overlapping the wall sheathing and attaching to a common framing member at this junction. The most common detail is shown here, where the rim board is used. However, there are other options. Those options include using the bottom plate on the upper floor, using blocking in the upper and lower level walls installed edgewise as shown here or flatwise, using the upper top plate on the lower floor, or finally using the lower top plate on the lower floor. All of these prescriptive options qualify as common framing and will help transfer shear forces between the panels on their way to the foundation. And here's what the detail looks like in practice. In this case, the rim board is being used as the common framing member. And in this example, blocking installed in both the upper and lower walls is being used as the common framing member. And in this case, the blocking is installed edgewise. However, it may also be installed flatwise. Another method is to use metal straps to resist the load in this location. This brings us to a very critical point in the load path where the ground floor walls meet the ground floor system and sill plate. Think about it. This is where all the lateral and uplift forces that have been gathered from the roof and walls meet the foundation. Remember this home we looked at earlier in the session that slid roughly 40 feet off of its foundation? Well, without a proper connection between the ground floor walls and the sill plate and the sill plate to the foundation wall, the risk of severe failure exists as illustrated in this example. <clears throat> Here too, we utilize the wood structural panel wall sheathing to strengthen the connection and help complete the load path from the roof down to the ground by overlapping with the sill and fastening with 8D nails spaced four inches on center. We also recommend the use of a three by three inch plate washer spaced every 32 to 48 inches on center to help prevent cross grain splitting of the sill plate. Again, this detail is taken from our Building for High Wind Resistance publication and exceeds the minimum code requirements and typical APA recommendations. If anyone is interested in the details we just reviewed, I recommend you download the system report displayed here, which is available on our website. It gives information related to the use of wood structural panel wall sheathing to provide combined shear and uplift resistance at these key locations. Now, for builders and designers specifying the use of raised heel trusses, a similar detail applies. Here too, you can put your wood structural panels to work by overlapping the wall sheathing with a raised heel truss. APA's raised heel trusses construction guide describes the key components and identifies the advantages of using this construction system in conjunction with continuous wood structural panel wall sheathing. 
The recommendations contained within this guide are designed for heel heights ranging between nine and a quarter and 15 and a quarter inches in depth. This detail not only allows for greater attic insulation, which has major energy benefits in both the US and Canada, but can also potentially reduce the amount of or eliminate the need for metal connectors. <clears throat> For heel heights ranging between 15 and a quarter and 24 inches in depth, APA has developed a separate system report. This report provides connection details which will allow a designer to utilize the wall sheathing to resist uplift loads on the roof, as well as provide lateral support for the trusses. Here is the detail in practice. When plywood or OSB wall sheathing is extended from the wall studs onto the ends of raised heel trusses, the resulting connection improves both lateral and uplift resistance. Such a connection can often eliminate the need to install blocking between trusses over braced wall panel locations, and as mentioned, potentially reduce the need for hurricane straps. This is a great segue into the next topic of discussion. So far, we have learned about using wood structural panels as part of our load path and how this helps add strength and rigidity to our structures. Next, we're gonna talk about how they can effectively be used in your compliance with energy codes. An added benefit with raised heel trusses is related to energy efficiency. The raised heel allows for the attic insulation to remain uncompressed over the wall top plates. The US energy code recognizes this detail as an advantage and provides prescriptive allowances for reduced attic insulation when it is used. This detail may also be utilized using a performance-based approach in both the US and Canada. The performance-based approach works by modeling the energy use of the home. It starts with a proposed design and compares the energy usage of that proposed home to the standard reference design or a home built using the prescriptive path. Since performance paths look at the building components as a system, they offer advantages over prescriptive paths. And some of those advantages can be seen here. They offer more flexibility in building design. They credit low infiltration and tight ducts. They credit high efficiency equipment, and the result is usually a lower cost when compared to the prescriptive path. These advantages can be increased even further with the use of advanced framing. To provide some additional clarity, APA has created the following publication to help builders and designers understand some of the options that exist. Though US values and codes are referenced in this publication, the concepts contained within are applicable in the Canadian region. I've worked with many energy advisors here in Canada who reference this publication with their customers quite often. For those of you interested in learning more, we also have an excellent webinar titled Meeting the Energy Code Using the Performance Path that offers some insightful information on this topic. <clears throat> Using table two in the publication, users can explore multiple options for different assemblies and components of a home. The table assigns a percent of energy score for wall systems with cavity insulation only, wall systems with cavity and continuous insulation, windows, roof systems, as well as lighting and HVAC systems. Assemblies and components given negative scores are more energy efficient and can be used to offset those that are not. For example, a project located in climate zone six, let's say Minneapolis, requires the performance equivalent to a two by six wall with R20 cavity insulation and a one inch layer of continuous insulation. This is using the prescriptive path. However, using the performance path, that same project could use a two by six advanced framed wall with R18 cavity insulation and no continuous insulation at all and offset the slight reduction in energy performance by using more energy efficient windows. This type of flexibility can have a major impact on the overall performance and cost of a structure. 
Energy codes in both the US and Canada also offer prescriptive-based options, which essentially work from a recipe of components and assemblies which together meet an overall energy use target. Some prescriptive-based tables allow for trade-off options to a limited degree. For example, in Canada, the 2015 National Building Code sets specific effective RSI or R value targets for above grade wall assemblies based on climate zones. The same applies for the Ontario Building Code SB12. Designers can meet effective RSI or R value targets. In the US, recent versions of the International Energy Conservation Code also set specific minimum U factor targets for above grade assemblies based on climate zones. These U factor targets range from 0 0.084 in the southernmost regions to 0 0.045 in the northernmost regions of the country. There are some great tools available to help builders and designers select above grade wall assemblies. The first resource that I would like to point out is the Effective R Calculator from the Canadian Wood Council which has over 10,000 wall assemblies in its database. Designers can use the tool to fine tune their assemblies and utilize the benefits of advanced framing with regards to effective R values. Another great resource is the IECC Compliance Options for Wood Frame Wall Assemblies publication available on the APA website. In it, you will find information related to effective R values, U factors, framing factors using conventional and advanced framing techniques, and much more. But regardless of which energy code path you choose, performance or prescriptive, wood structural panel wall sheathing can be used as a code approved air barrier system and acts as a solid base for spray foam or blown insulation products. Air barriers are systems of code approved materials capable of resisting airflow and pressure that completely enclose the air within a building. Wood structural panels are excellent code approved air barrier materials that are rigid and durable, which are two important characteristics to consider when selecting a material to be part of a continuous air barrier system. As I mentioned on the previous slide, North American produced plywood and OSB products with a performance category of 3 8 or greater are recognized as air barrier materials by ASHRAE, the International Residential Code, the International Energy Conservation Code, and the National Building Code of Canada. For more detailed information, APA has developed a technical topic that discusses the performance of wood structural panels when used as part of air barrier systems, which is available to download from our website. Fully sheathed walls also provide a solid backing for blown in insulation systems and create an efficient, strong wall system. Spray in cellulose, Fiberglass and mineral wool insulation can provide high R values, which is desirable in some markets. So by now we should be starting to see the big picture as we walk through these benefits and understand how they're all connected. Another extremely valuable benefit that comes with full wood structural panel wall sheathing is their ability to be used as a nail base for the attachment of siding, trim, brick ties, and many other cladding types. Continuous plywood or OSB wall sheathing is a secure, code compliant nail base that provides an easy and effective solution for attaching all claddings. Let's review some of the advantages that plywood and OSB wood structural panels offer when used as a nail base. They eliminate the need for cladding installers to hit the studs, they allow for the use of shorter fasteners and require that they fully penetrate the OSB or plywood by one quarter inch. They ensure that cladding materials stay in place during high wind events. And they eliminate the need for additional blocking to support ventilation and siding when ends don't fall on studs. 
without OSB or plywood to act as a nail base, the siding, along with any mechanical or electrical services, as well as wide exterior trim, will need to be fastened directly to the studs or to additional blocking installed within the wall framing as shown here. When it comes to fastening recommendations when using OSB or plywood as a nail base for your siding and trim, APA has you covered. Our nail base sheathing for siding and trim attachment construction guide provides an easy method for determining the type and spacing of siding fasteners to satisfy building code requirements when using wood structural panel sheathing as a nail base for cladding materials with weights up to three PSF. This includes wood lap and panel siding, vinyl siding, fiber cement, wood shingles and shakes, synthetic stucco, and other popular cladding materials. Depending on the fastener type, and the performance category of the wall sheathing, you will find the recommended fastener substitution schedule. Just note that when using ring shank nails or wood screws, the fastener substitution schedule is one-to-one -one versus smooth or screw shank nails, which, which may require additional fasteners. And this benefit was put to the test by the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, and the results are clear. Siding attached directly to continuously sheathed plywood or OSB walls is able to withstand the same wind and weather conditions as siding attached directly to framing. In fact, siding need not be attached to any framing members so long as fasteners fully penetrate the sheathing by a minimum of one quarter inch and the correct fastening schedule is followed. This is also true even when siding is attached to plywood or OSB through a layer of non-structural continuous insulation up to two inches in thickness. As you can see, even after the roof system completely failed due to a high wind force, the siding remained intact. If the weight of your cladding materials exceeds three PSF, we have a technical topic which discusses fastening requirements for, for cladding materials with weights up to 11 PSF. However, this only applies when cladding materials are attached directly to the wood structural panel wall sheathing. For builders who specify the use of a brick veneer, both OSB and plywood wall sheathing may also be used as a nail base to support brick ties and eliminate the need to hit studs. Without sufficient lateral resistance, wall systems providing support for cladding and brick veneers can fail, as shown here. In this case, the structure moved significantly and was unable to support the brick veneer. And here are a few more examples of brick veneer failures. Remember that the cladding or veneer is being supported by the wall. So the wall needs to be braced such that it will not deflect or rack during high wind events or earthquakes. If the wall framing is able to move, so too will the material attach to it, including brittle cladding like brick veneer. In the US, IRC table R703.8.4 specifies fastener types, sizes, and on-center spacing of brick ties when wood structural panels are used as a nail base. The required brick tie vertical and horizontal spacing depends on wind speed and level of exposure. In Canada, it isn't quite as clearly defined, but the concepts are the same. Be sure to check with your brick tie manufacturer for more information. If we take a moment to step back and reflect on the many benefits that we have discussed so far today, we will notice that there are still a few items that we have not yet discussed. So far, we have learned how these benefits work independently from one another. However, as we approach the end of our session today, I would like to take a moment to explain how they can be used together in an effective way to efficiently frame our walls while maintaining the important structural elements of our buildings. This can be achieved by applying advanced framing techniques and details 
to our above grade wall systems in order to boost their effective R values or U factors. And as we learned earlier in the session, this can be utilized from an energy code compliance perspective. When combined with full wood structural panel wall sheathing, these techniques and details allow users to optimize material use, increase wall insulation factors, and withstand all design loads. APA's Advanced Framing Construction Guide is a 24-page booklet that describes most of the techniques in detail. All of the details that we will be reviewing in the coming slides are located within this guide, which is available to download from our website. We also have a webinar on our website that goes into greater detail on this subject. And here we see the full suite of advanced framing details. Insulated headers, raised heel trusses, two or three stud corners, single top plates with inline framing stacked loading, and two by six wall studs spaced up to 24 inches on center. We see efficient use of framing around openings, and we also see fully sheathed walls to help tie everything together. So those are the full suite of details, but in Canada, not all of the details that we just reviewed are required in order to comply with the prescriptive code. As you can see, the 2015 National Building Code of Canada defines advanced framing as insulated or flush headers, corners with two studs, ladder blocking at T intersections, efficient use of framing around openings, and double top plates. In the US, builders and designers can select which advanced framing details they'd like to use based on the path they choose for energy code compliance but all details are referenced as options in the IRC or IECC. As a general rule, the International Energy Conservation Code requires all voids and walls to be filled with insulation. This includes at headers if they are not flushed out with wood, at corners, and where interior walls intersect the exterior wall. These and other ins insulation requirements are called out in IECC table R402.4.1.1. Let's start by reviewing the way we frame our corners. Here we see a three stud corner commonly referred to as a California corner. This detail allows for cavity insulation to be installed in these areas, which helps reduce thermal bridging and boost effective R values or U factors. This is a much more energy efficient option when compared to a traditional corner, which is no longer permitted in the energy code. Two stud corners are accepted in the US code, however, they are not an advanced framing requirement. In Canada, however, two stud corners are an advanced framing requirement. One option to provide support for the gypsum wall sheathing in this location is to specify the use of a drywall clip as shown here. Or a more popular option can be seen here where the ladder blocking is used. This detail utilizes cutoff material to provide support for the interior gypsum at these locations. Instead of paying someone to pick it up and throw it in a bin and then paying someone else to come pick up that bin full of material that you've already paid for, why not use it in these areas to reduce waste and help boost effective R values or U factors? This outside corner that you see is a perfect example where using wood structural panel wall sheathing will help simplify the attachment of siding, trim, brick ties, or other cladding materials. Ladder blocking can also be used at ladder junctions where interior walls butt up against exterior wall systems as shown here. Again, reducing waste on the job site and allowing more room for full depth insulation at these locations. This detail provides the best insulating potential at intersecting walls, but can be a bit challenging to install. It leaves space between the interior wall and the exterior wall such that a sheet of gypsum can be slid through the gap. 
The size of our headers is another critical advanced framing component. I often see three ply two by tens over three or four foot openings with not much load from above. It makes me wonder if perhaps a single ply structural composite lumber or glue lamb header will work, allowing room for cavity insulation to be installed over the opening. This is true if the header is installed above the opening with a cripple, as shown in the image on the left, or under the top plate, as shown in the image on the right. Panel box headers are another great option as they provide full depth cavity insulation over the opening. The use of 15 30 seconds category wood structural panel wall sheathing on the exterior of the wall over the opening with proper nailing to the framing members can be a great choice for openings up to 60 inches in width. As I mentioned, just a few additional fasteners or nails are required. But also re remember that the panels must be a minimum of 15 30 seconds category and the strength axis must run horizontal. One of my favorite details can be seen here. Why not integrate the header flush within the floor system itself? A double rim header may work depending on load and span conditions, but is limited to a maximum span of four feet. For openings wider than four feet, a structural composite lumber or glue lamb header would also work in this location, as long as the depths match that of the eye joists. An added benefit of this detail is that the headers are sized and located on the engineered wood floor system layouts. Another advanced framing detail, this one is optional, mind you, is the use of single top plates, which requires that all common roof wall and floor framing members line up or stack and the offset distance between them must not exceed 50 millimeters or two inches max for our Canadian viewers and for our American viewers you are limited to a one inch max offset distance. With two by six walls the use of double top plates simplifies the offset rules as there is no maximum offset allowance for common framing members as illustrated on this slide. Common roof, wall, and floor framing members can be spaced at 12, 16, 19, 2, or 24 inches on center and they do not need to line up. The one exception to this rule are girder trusses and beams which will require additional support no matter how many top plates are used. So those are the details. And when we stand back and compare, compare a conventionally framed wall, as shown here, with the same wall using advanced framing techniques and details, we can really see the difference. This wall optimizes the framing elements and allows more room for insulation which boosts the effective R value or U factor of the assembly. And when we overlay the two assemblies, it becomes clear just how much more room for insulation is created without compromising structure. There is a common misconception that two by four studs, spaced 16 inches on center, are stronger than two by six studs spaced 24 inches on center. As you can see, while there are a few items that require attention, overall, the design of the wall is not affected. In fact, two by six studs spaced 24 inches on center are two and a half times stiffer and 1.4 times stronger in bending when compared to two by four studs spaced 16 inches on center. So how many of those details are you already using? and how much effort would it take to implement just a few more. Here are a few examples of wall assemblies with and without advanced framing details. And as you can see, their effective R values or U factors are given a boost when advanced framing is applied. All right, now that we have a better understanding of the big picture, I think we can all agree that full wood structural panel wall sheathing comes with many benefits. We discussed how they can be used to create a structural shell 
protecting our buildings against lateral and uplift forces that occur during seismic and high wind events. We learned about prescriptive and performance-based energy code compliance options for above grade wall assemblies and how wood structural panels can be used as part of the air barrier system while at the same time provide backing for multiple insulation types. We learned how they can be used as a nail base to support siding, trim, brick ties, and numerous other cladding types, even with increased on-center stud spacing. We even discussed how to tie all of these benefits together with the use of advanced framing techniques and details and how this benefits us from an energy code perspective by boosting the effective R values or U factors of our wall assemblies. There is one remaining benefit to discuss before we conclude our session today. Wood structural panel wall sheathing is sourced from certified North American forests, which make them completely sustainable. It seems that every day we are learning more about the environmental benefits of using wood in construction and how it sequesters carbon in the structure over the course of its lifespan and allows for the replanting of trees to absorb more carbon dioxide. It is this cycle of planting, growing, harvesting, sequestering in buildings, and replanting that make wood an excellent sustainable resource. Here are a few North American forest facts. A growing forest absorbs 1.4 tons of carbon dioxide for every one ton of wood produced. In the US, there are roughly 20% more trees than there were 50 years ago, totaling over 766 million acres. Canada has roughly 860 million acres of forest, of which 405 million are certified to third-party standards of sustainable forest management. And finally, global carbon dioxide emissions could be reduced by as much as 31% if builders used wood instead of steel and concrete. If anyone is interested in learning more about this topic, there are two webinars available on our webpage specifically dedicated to wood as a sustainable building material. Today, we have learned that continuous wood structural panel wall sheathing lends structural integrity to the complete building system and boasts not only strength, but sustainability. Continuously sheathed wood walls simplify siding attachment, provide uplift resistance, and lateral support for raised heel trusses and result in a strong, resilient structure using a renewable, sustainable, and readily available resource. On behalf of APA, thank you all for tuning in today. I hope you found some value in the information that was shared. Uh, Warren, are there any questions? Okay, thanks, Corey. And we have had some questions come in. So before we begin our Q&A, uh, I would like to remind everybody that we really do value your feedback on uh, today's webinar. There's a QR code on the screen that's going to link you to uh, today's survey. So just open your camera on your smartphone and a link is going to take you to that survey. Uh, so please take a, take a minute to fill those out. So we did have quite a few questions come in and uh, we've got time to go over a few of those. Uh, first, you mentioned your building for high wind resistance publication was for um, above code designs. Is there a wind speed that these details are designed to meet? Good question. Well, while many of these details will improve uh, performance compared with houses built to code minimum requirements, there's really no one size fits all answer. An engineer may be able to determine how the details relate to the resistance uh, of a sp specified load or wind speed, but that will depend on such things as the, the house design, including the layout, materials used, and the building location. Okay, good. Um, this is a pretty common question that we get and it came in today. Uh, 
what are the APA's fastening recommendations for wood structural panel wall sheeting? Aha. Uh, APA fastener recommendations for wood structural panels are six inches on center along panel ends and edges and 12 inches on center in the field of the panel. These recommendations match the prescriptive requirements for both the International Residential Code and the National Building Code of Canada as well. Engineered shear walls or walls in high wind or seismic regions may require tighter fastener spacing. So it's always important to ensure fasteners are installed as listed on the plans. And also really quickly, I can't speak about fastening without mentioning the need to space all panels an eighth of an inch on all four sides. Leaving an eighth of an inch space allows for the panels to expand and contract as they acclimate to the moisture conditions of the job site. Doing so will help minimize the risk of wavy walls in the future. Yeah, I'm glad you covered that. We did have a question that we answered during the session uh, asking about the recommended spacing around panels, and that is a, a really critical, uh, really critical thing to cover. Uh, next question. Uh, you mentioned wood structural panel wall sheathing can act as a nail base to support cladding materials with weights of three pounds per square foot or less. So uh, two kind of similar questions. What happens when the cladding weight exceeds three pounds per square foot? And then why can't heavier cladding materials be installed to wood structural panel wall sheathing through continuous insulation? So if you could cover that. Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, when cladding materials are fastened to wood structural panel wall sheathing through a layer of continuous insulation up to a maximum of two inches in thickness, the fasteners are essentially cantilevered, which limits the amount of weight they can carry. So for this reason, cladding materials with weights exceeding 3 PSF must be installed directly to wood structural panel wall sheathing when you're using it as a nail base. Good. Um, so the next question. On one slide, you show, you show three different walls where the continuously sheathed wall is better than the intermittent wall. Uh, mm -hmm. In the pictures, the walls look very different. Did you test the walls with the same opening configuration uh, and how are they comparable? Another good question. Uh, you are correct. The wood structural panel base wall assembly consisted of open stud framing with four foot wide intermittent bracing and the framing did not include openings for windows. The CS wood structural panel assembly was continuously sheathed but had multiple window openings. The graph simply illustrates that a fully sheathed wall with multiple openings is able to withstand 88% more racking force than a partially sheathed wall with no openings. Uh, the full test report can be downloaded from our website for those of you who want to dig into the details a little bit deeper. Okay, we're going to do uh, one last question and then and then close up with with a little bit of housekeeping. So the last question we're going to take is, uh, you mentioned one by four lead in bracing. Um, can you use metal lead in bracing? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, there are options for metal bracing that can provide racking resistance, but there are a few things to consider. First, the metal straps may only resist tension. So you might need to make an X instead of just one diagonal. And second, any diagonal bracing is required to be installed at a 45 to 60 degree angle from top to bottom plate, which limits the amount of openings in the wall. Um, I guess for more detailed information, I recommend reaching out to the manufacturers of the metal bracing. Okay, thanks again, Corey. Um, if any of you have questions that we didn't get to, uh, what we're going to do is share those with our field services team and someone will get back to you as soon as we can. Before we conclude, I'd like to touch on a few quick things. We want to make sure that you're signed up to receive our APA update newsletter. And this is so you'll be notified of our future webinars and updates to APA publications and standards. So to receive this, um, all you'll need to do is from our homepage, click the sign in button on the upper right hand corner of the page. The drop down menu 
uh, in the drop down menu, simply select register. And then you just need to let us know what you'd like to receive from APA. Uh, in this case, it's the APA update newsletter. Lastly, APA has field staff located throughout the country. Uh, these talented people are available to assist design professionals, builders, and code officials. Their individual contact information can be found on our APA website, apawood.org. So please reach out and uh, take advantage of this free resource. And don't forget to download the AIA or ICC Certificate of Completion. So with that, uh, we would like to thank you very much for attending and have a great rest of your day.